In today's video, we have another great example of why my wife keeps trying to take my Facebook marketplace away. This 2013 FRS with a rod knock and uh, some paint defects and some great wheels. First thing we're going to do is disconnect the battery and you can leave the exhaust manifold on if it's a stock one, some headers, you're better off just taking it off on the car. And so we're going to start just removing the air box, um, that air tube that pumps a sound into the cabin right there. And um, we'll have to disconnect the AC compressor. You don't have to actually remove everything. You can just kind of unbolt it and then move it off to the side. I think it's three 14 millimeter bolts for that. Right now, just removing the radiator hoses. That's the main engine harness. There's just two harnesses to unclip back there. And then you'll have to disconnect the O2 sensors also. There's a couple of grounds. There's one there. And it's just a little 10 millimeter bolt on the bottom of the engine. And each side has one of those grounds. And you can see how the O2 sensor setup is with this header. But if you're using a stock car, then it'll look a little bit different. And you can see the ground right there as well through the uh, O2 sensor. So you see we got the AC compressor off to the side. I don't have it fully folded over there because I don't want to hurt the line, but you can do that when you pull the engine. And there's really not that many bolts for the bell housing. I think there's six total, two for the starter. You can see where the Slave cylinder is off to the side right there. And that's where the two bolts are that mount the uh, slave cylinder to the clutch fork. You can use one of the holes where the AC compressor was for your engine hoist. And then there's a like hole in the back that you can put a bolt through with a washer on or whatever to put the other side of the hoist on. It might take a little bit to get it separated um, because of you know the input shaft and stuff going through the clutch. Obviously the clutch and the pressure plate just stay on the engine until you take it out. And so you just make sure that you got the AC compressor off to the side like that. Make sure that your grounds on the bottom on each side were taken off or they'll just snap when you pull that out. 
And you should be good to go. All right, so now we just got to swap things over from the old engine to the new one. So what I see so far are the heater core hoses, um, obviously the clutch flywheel. Once I get that off, we'll see how it is. Uh, the guy had said it was a fairly new clutch, so as long as that's true, we'll just leave it. All right, so we got the throttle body on this. This is the new engine right here, the new used one. I found a wrench that fit perfectly in there so that I could tighten these. Uh, I think the first pass is something like 40 foot-pounds and then 64 foot-pounds for the second pass on the flywheel bolts. Next thing we're gonna do is mount the clutch disc and the pressure plate and get that all situated too. Time to mount the clutch and pressure plate. You can see the clutch alignment tool there in the middle to help keep it aligned while you uh, fasten everything. I think it's 26 foot pounds for those. You do it in a star pattern and just start at a lower torque at first. But just double check the torque on that. Time to put it back in. You want to angle it so those studs on the bottom of the engine slip into the bell housing. Uh, so you just got to get the right angle with the transmission and the engine so it kind of slips in there. Probably put the transmission in neutral at first in case the splines aren't lining up. Uh, and then you can put it back in gear once you got it in. can see that gap there um, typically you can close that up just using the bell housing bolts it just depends you want to make sure that it's actually in there and not jammed somewhere so now we're just putting the heater hoses back on all the coolant hoses And you can see where the exhaust manifold mounts. I just put a little RTV on the gasket so that it sticks to the engine. So when you're trying to put the manifold on, the gasket's not trying to fall off there. You can see the main harness back there. Right now what I'm doing is just pulling the um, fuel pump fuse so that the car won't start so that I can just prime it and get the oil going first.
topping off the coolant now. No weird noises so far. Ended up doing the brakes, rotors, and pads on here because all the pads pretty much look like that. Not much left. Rotors don't look great either. Thankfully, they're pretty easy to do. I did have to put a bolt into this hole on the rear ones. Um, when you tighten the bolt in here, it pushes against the inside and pops the rotor off. Otherwise, they were just stuck on there. And hopefully it comes with new hardware in the brake pad box, but we'll find out. Also, got some new tires. These Coopers. Uh, where's the model of them? The Xeon RS3 G1. Uh, they were like clearance at Tire Rack for 90 bucks. I think they're regularly like 130 or something like that. So seemed like a good good enough deal. I'm gonna pull these clips and just soak them in some PB Blast or something. They're not that bad. The fronts are worse, but they came with new ones. So this obviously isn't the best way to do it, but I just put an old pad in so I don't have a piston compress kind of tool. So just do it with some big channel locks and use the old brake pad. So I'm just adjusting the e-brake shoes here so that the new rotor can fit on. So we just got to move that a little bit so the hole lines up. It's pretty much in the middle of these two. There we go. I guess it didn't come with a new cap. For the front brakes, I ended up just putting the pads into the caliper bracket first because it was hard to get it in um, while it was mounted. And then after that, I was able to put the caliper over and uh, slide it on. After these are done, it's on to fix all the cosmetic stuff, or at least most of it.
So I just wet sanded this part and you can see these scratches are everywhere. See the shiny part? See how much more there is up there? And then down here, there's really none. So it just took a few passes with 1500 grit. And then when I polish this, it should all come back without the scratches. So, uh, I don't know, it's hard to tell, but there's some right in here. Yeah, there you go, you see those scratches? Now they're pretty much gone. Now you can see the paint shining through. So thankfully it doesn't take much on this car, but it's got a crazy amount of those. So there's still some deeper scratches that I'm not gonna be able to get to. And some light ones I still need a buff again, but you can just see how much clearer it is. It's crazy. Like, look at the difference between that side and this side. And look at the pearls coming through. So I bought this thing for 3500 and I put about 4500 including the brakes and the engine and everything. Um, so my total into this thing was 8000 I ended up selling it for eleven five. dollars um, So not too bad, $3,500 profit for probably a week worth of working on it.